Welcome back to Close Up. While the Black Lives Matter movement has become a major focal point of policymaking alongside the pandemic this summer, other minority groups are working to raise awareness as well. Connecting with us this morning from the Lakes region is Paul Puglio, Sagamo of the Kawasuk Band of the Penacook Abenaki people. Thanks for joining us on Close Up, Paul. Nice seeing you again, Adam. So as more Americans come to grips with issues of racial inequity, what does this mean for indigenous people? Well, in our particular case, it means we're extremely busy. We're often overlooked or ignored in discussions of race and equality due to the fact that in, us as indigenous people are a super minority representing less than 2% of the population. The current race and equity movement affects indigenous lives in many ways. The foundation of the nation was really built on uh, systemic racism through the theft of indigenous land, resources, and labor. But it's been largely ignored in the in the storytelling of American history. For the last four years, we've been developing a community research team, including UNH students and professors. And we call the, 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 proje the project called Indigenous New Hampshire Collective Collaborative, where we focus on education and history by developing an interactive map of New Hampshire history that includes the indigenous perspective to ensure a common future for our state and our history. And that's where we've been really focusing most of our attention right now. One of the focal points for a long time has been the NFL football team in Washington. Uh, that name is changing. Uh, we don't know what the next mascot will be, but what's her reaction to this initial name change? Well, in my opinion, the Washington Redskins was probably the most racist and controversial of all the major sports franchises. However, we still have quite a few remaining teams left to be, you know, to make some kind of change. We hope through continued education, the remaining teams will make that change from the indigenous mascots and logos and come up with other uh, imagery for their, uh, for their teams and franchises. What do you think about that? I mean, for such a long time, people were clinging to that team name. And uh, really, no matter how you look at it, either as an epithet, it's offensive, or I believe the origin there was a bounty that was paid for uh, indigenous scalps in Washington. So why do you think people held on to that for so long? It's, it's part of the, the continued uh, narrative that started with colonial days where, um, you know, the Boston Tea Party was the first time that people dressed up as Indians and, and you know, protested. So it, be, it became kind of a national uh, issue where the, it kind of morphed over, over the years to, to include teams and other things. It really wasn't an honoring. It was more of a in-your-face that uh, uh, we can do what we do. And unfortunately... Um, these these images uh, have lasted so long and there is some history about uh, you know indigenous people being in professional sports but that's long uh, overlooked now uh, it's it's really it's got to change how about here in new hampshire obviously nothing on par with uh, the washington team name but are there mascots of high schools or other institutions here in new hampshire that you think need to change well, for the last nine months, we've been working with 10 uh, school systems in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, seven of which are in New Hampshire. Um, most of them have names like Red Raiders, Indians, Tomahawks, or Warriors, or some other uh, derogatory term or, or imagery. And we've been working with the towns uh, through their activism with their own uh, grassroots movements to to address these issues and we've made quite a bit of progress and most of the towns are, are very open to talk to us about changing the mascots and reframing some of their the iconic images that they use for the towns. Are there ways to do this that can honor the tradition of indigenous people here in America or is it pretty tough to do that at all? It's pretty tough to do that when you use things like Red Raiders or, uh, or use tomahawks. It, it's like using an M16 for an image. It doesn't make sense. You know, a tomahawk is a weapon. Uh, warriors and, and Red Raiders and, and other terms which they use are usually co-mixed with imagery of Western or Plains Indian images, which are really inappropriate in this area. But we're also working with towns and their, their town seals in the symbology they've used, which came from colonial roots. Some of those are actually showing indigenous people in a more generalized sense and not as offensive. But these, these towns, when you get into sports, you develop 
people wearing uh, regalia, you know, and, and and putting on war bonnets and doing tomahawk chops. So we have to draw a line somewhere. These are all inappropriate, and they are not honoring us in any way. In fact, we actually submit, uh, we have an open letter describing why uh, mascots and these logos are offensive. And we, whenever a town makes an inquiry, we send them off uh, a historical perspective of why it's inappropriate. There's also been some discussion lately of the Hannah Dustin Memorial in Boscoin. For those who don't know, uh, this is a statue representing or honoring a woman. Uh, the story goes that she, I believe, was abducted from uh, somewhere in what would have been northern Massachusetts. Some family members of hers were killed by the indigenous people there. Uh, she was taken up to an area near the confluence of the Kentuckuk and Merrimack Rivers uh, where she was able to avenge this. Uh, and there was, uh, you know, uh, a very bloody scene that involved some... Uh, Revenge killing. Um, obviously, it's a unique event in history. It's been celebrated uh, in the past and kind of fallen away, but that statue is still there. What's your perspective on that statue and how that should be viewed moving forward? Well, when the Black Lives Movement started, you know, really taking some traction here and people were tearing down Confederate monuments and even Christopher Columbus monuments, we, we knew that the, the Hannah Dustin Monument was going to be one of the major focuses in New Hampshire. So we developed the goal in a project that was going to turn the space into a welcoming and educational destination for locals and tourists alike. We've been working uh, on a name which is going to call it, we're trying to call it Unity Park Nandakina, which translates to our land in Abnaki. Our goal is to promote New Hampshire materials, artisans, skills, and knowledge wherever possible for the site. And we've made a proposal for the park thus, thus far about cleaning up the, the monument, preserving future damage, and it, changing the whole landscape to remove inv invasive species and make this to a welcoming uh, location. Our proposed additions to the park uh, would be to purchase part of the railroad track along the park to develop a community rail to add existing you know, another statues, which include uh, some of the discussions about Cotton Mather's original telling of the story and will enable visitors to see a different and shifting perspectives of, of time as they arrive to their own conclusions. We, we're proposing to add a new monument on the site to uh, honor local indigenous Abnaki people discussing the life and the customs and land use. We also want to add things about the Merrimack River and its many uses over the centuries for transportation and, and industry. And, and with this, we want to talk about the railroad history and how it changed the landscape of the state. And we're going to add, we we're proposing to add other historical plaques and signs depicting various regional historical events and, and then make it user friendly. Add benches, tables, and other desired public features, and maybe make a canoe or a kayak launch for recreation and change the landscaping. It's kind of a, a hidden gem, it's kind of off the, the highway and it's down uh, over a railroad uh, bridge. We're, we're proposing to work with many uh, agencies in the state, with the parks uh, uh, group. We're planning to work with the Department of Historical Resources, local communities, New Hampshire uh, Historical Society, and others. And we're going to try to make this an all-inclusive park that really reframes it. Rather than getting rid of history, we want to reframe it and, and bring it to forefront so that it's an educational moment for people to realize that things have changed over time and, and the story has to be told more broadly. And it's an important site in, in the, almost the heart of our state, so close to the capital. We think it needs to be developed as a, a major parks project. And we're working on it right now. We're on Facebook. Oh, you know, it's called Unity um, Park in Nandakina. And we're getting comments from everybody from the Dustin family to historians to interested parties and of all those natures, including, you know, all the features that are already existent on that site. Speaking of history, you've so, long been involved. Mouthful. Oh yeah, you've long been involved in the efforts uh, at the legislature to try and change uh, the name of Columbus Day in New Hampshire to Indigenous Peoples Day. Do you think that'll get any more traction this time around, or is this still going to be a pretty big fight up there? Well, the pandemic really slowed down any legislative activities on our part because everything is now on a Zoom basis, but. We are continuing to forge ahead with grassroots community action town by town. We have quite a few towns that are, are bringing this up to the, the select board. And, and we actually got some traction with the towns. And eventually, we figured there'd be enough momentum and public uh, attention uh, drawn to Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day as an alternative. And I think, I think as a grassroots movement, 
we'll get that momentum and maybe we can go forward with something on the state legislature level. It's just like the mascots where we're going to be proposing to carry on from where the Department of Education made a memorandum in 2002 to, to ban mascots. We're going to propose legislation that actually does that so that we enter the, the, the other states that have already banned mascots legislatively to, to get over this hump and, and, and remove these kinds of imagery uh, of Native American people. All right, Paul Puglio, Sagamo of the Kawasuk Band of the Penacook Abenaki people. Thanks for joining us on Close Up this morning. We appreciate Thank you. your time. Thank you. All right, be well. Thank you very much, Adam.